Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Oliver Hartwich and I'm the Executive Director of the New Zealand Initiative. Tonight we're here to launch our latest report, The Health of the State, written by Janessa Jaren. And uh, I'm very glad to see all of you here. Thank you very much for making it to this very important launch of this new report. A special welcome, of course, to our members who um, have made this possible, who make everything possible that the initiative does. And welcome to all of you, no matter where you stand in these debates. We thought it is important to have evidence-based research. We are an evidence-based think tank. But we also believe it is important to have evidence-based policy. And we are concerned that with a lot of regulations that are currently being discussed or introduced in other parts of the world, that's not always the case. We are seeing a lot of policy activism in some areas on food, on beverages, where we have questions about the efficiency of these regulations, and we think that you need good evidence to make the case for these regulations, especially when new taxes, new regulations impinge on our liberty, on consumer sovereignty. That was the starting point of this research, and for the past year or so, Janessa has been working on these issues, and the health of the state is the result of her work. Janessa will talk to us about the research and summarize its findings in a minute, and then we are really glad and privileged to have an excellent panel with us tonight to share their, um, to share their opinions with us and their views on Janessa's research. And I would like to introduce our panel in the order of um, their, their speaking to us. So we'll kick off with Janessa Jerem, who's a policy analyst with the New Zealand Initiative and has been with us for three years and is the author of the report. Please welcome Janessa Jerem. <laughs> Our first commentator on the report is the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury and the Chief Economist at the Treasury, that's Kiro Kawazoglu. leader of the Maori Party, Marama Fox. <laughs> and finally to my far left, but that's not his usual position, <laughs> yes. the, form, <laughs> the former leader of the Act Party, Jamie White. <laughs> Without further ado, I'll now hand you over to Janessa, then we'll hear from you all, Marama and Jamie, and afterwards we'll have time for your questions and hopefully quite a few answers. Thank you again for what you do much liberty, 
policies still need to be based on good evidence. The report uses case studies to illustrate these points. I looked at policies aimed at <coughs> curbing obesity, quitting smoking, and reducing youth binge drinking. For obesity, the report examines food taxes, such as sugar, fat, and soda taxes. For smoking, it looks at, it looks at the diminishing returns to the current excise regime, and looks at e-cigarettes as a promising alternative. And it looks at alcohol marketing, and whether it has a causal effect on youth binge drinking. Probably not surprisingly, tonight I'm going to focus on food taxes, but please do ask me questions on the other two case studies at the end, because they're both lots of fun as well. And in case you tune out for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to Surprise, I'm going to give you the report's conclusion from the start. The short story is that the short story is that not only can lifestyle regulation be based on poor evidence, they're also morally contestable. And given the government has no consistent framework for bringing in new policies, this should be of serious concern. Just because public health is the flavour of the month today, no industry is actually safe from creeping paternalism. <laughs> From the financial sector to how you even raise your kids, nanny state regulations are everywhere. So taking liberty as our starting point means recognising that different people have different preferences and that we all value different things. Now there are a few people who blatantly argue against liberty as this terrible thing, but they could say that it is safe to assume that most people would say that health is a good thing and the government should promote good things. And yes, that may be true, health is a great thing. But economics em emphasises the importance of trade-offs. All decisions involve trade-offs. And while health is important, well-being is important too. For example, a salad may be better for you, but a donut can make you happier. And yes, donuts are on my mind at the moment because of the type of major about report. Likewise, going for a run after work may help you lose weight. But sometimes, after a hard day of work, and again, I'm not saying I have hard days at work, but <laughs> if you were to have a hard day at work, there's nothing more therapeutic than cracking open a cold beer. So living for the future, as opposed to the present, is also a trade-off. What is enjoyable today may be expensive in the long run, but it's a decision we all need to make for ourselves. Unlike physical can't make assumptions about what enhances people's overall sense of well-being. What makes us healthy doesn't always make us happy. And what <coughs> makes us happy isn't always good for us. People don't drink to excess because they enjoy the hangover. Or smoke because of all the amazing health benefits. They do it because they receive some marginal unit of pleasure from the activity. So now on to food tests. Although there are major differences in fat, sugar, and soda taxes, and the report does recognise that, there are still some lessons that can be transferable across all these groups, which is why the report does look at food taxes broadly. Besides, the taxes are now implemented in such different ways in different countries that the lines between them are already beginning to blow quite a bit. So what this report finds is that there is very little evidence to date that these taxes will work. And actually, even some advocates of the tax have admitted as much. Most studies fail to prove that food taxes will reduce the obesity rate. Taxes may reduce consumption, or how much people spend on the product, but that's not the same as reducing obesity. It could be argued that there's no harm in experimenting, or that the tax could have some kind of symbolic value. But this report finds that actually, the potential harm is major. It could make poor households even poorer. Now it's easy to think that the poor are disproportionately obese, and that's borne out in the statistics, and they're also most likely to be the most price sensitive. If the price of the good goes up, they're probably not going to be able to afford as much. But that ignores whether these households substitute untaxed, but equally unhealthy foods. It ignores whether they switch to cheaper brands, or even whether they reduce their spending in other areas to compensate. It's also a little condescending to assume that obese people 
or those at risk of it, or those at risk of obesity, need to be forced into healthy lifestyles because they lack self-control or ability to learn healthy habits. So now I'd just like to pass on a few other key messages on sugar taxes that seem to be missed from the public debate so far. First, sugar is not tobacco. A common comparison is that tobacco taxes have decreased the smoking rate, so sugar taxes should have the same type of effect. But think of the magnitude the tobacco taxes are currently at. It's around 150% of the actual price of the that's way more than what most advocates are asking for. And, and if it is the intention to someday raise the price of food by that much, advocates at least need to be transparent about that. Tobacco and sugary foods are also different in that tobacco has few substitutes, whereas sugary foods or soda have many. Again, it could be argued that soda or sugar is just the beginning and that the tax will eventually be extended to all junk food. If the end goal is a more comprehensive tax, or a package of interventions that do affect individual choice, then again this needs to be made explicit from the start. To have a similar effect to the tobacco tax, the tax would need to be really high, and the replacements for soda quite low. The second point I want to bring up is about ring-fencing the revenue from the sugar taxes to go towards these health promoting programs. And it's one of those theories that does sound nice in practice. But actually, it makes little real sense. If the point of the tax is to reduce consumption, then it's not going to raise a lot of revenue for these healthy programs. If the aim is to fund these health programs, then questions need to be asked about why these programs weren't being funded in the first place through the government budget. If it is a good and effective program, why hesitate funding it? Ring-fencing the revenue just complicates the tax system, although perhaps there is a more, more experted... <laughs> <laughs> there is an expert going <laughs> to speak on these taxes next, and probably has better vocabulary. <laughs> um, so, the last point I want to cover is on sugar taxes, and, and the fact that they could be introduced to address the growing cost of the health system. If obesity costs the taxpayer money, then perhaps sugar taxes could kind of internalise that cost. But if advocates want to run, run this line of argument that obesity is, is expensive, then why aren't we taxing any and all risky or harmful activities? Or why aren't all healthy activities subsidised? Better yet, why can't those who choose risky or socially frowned upon activities simply opt out? of the public health system. The fact of the matter is, we've got a public health system, and for the time being, we're sticking with it. Unless we start taxing and subsidising all health-affecting activities, choosing just some is discrimination. So now for some very quick takeaway messages from the other two case studies. The first case study was on e-cigarettes and opens by describing the failure of the current tobacco excise regime. Despite massive increases in excise tax, smoking rates are now only declining incrementally. This tells us two things. Either there are some people who don't actually want to quit, or the current cessation methods just aren't working for them. Meanwhile, e-cigarettes currently face crazy regulatory hurdles. The main justifi justification given is that there is a lack of long-term evidence that these products are safe. <coughs> or there's lack of long-term evidence that they proved successful in helping people quit. But keep in mind that because e-cigarettes are quite new anyway, lack of long-term evidence is pretty much inevitable. What is known, and this is the important part, is that e-cigarettes are less harmful than smoking. And to date, there has been no robust evidence that they cause any undue risk. Here we have a regulatory regime we can buy cigarettes at any corner dairy, but you cannot have access to the less harmful alternative. And now on to alcohol, the last case study. So the last case study looks at alcohol marketing and its effect on youth binge drinking. First, the report finds no strong evidence to suggest that alcohol marketing causes youth binge drinking. What it does find is an erosion of personal responsibility. The solution to such a is not strict to bar closing times. It's not fiddly with the 
price of alcohol or limiting its availability. What is needed is better enforcement of current laws rather than just introducing new ones and hoping they'll make a difference. It also requires a cultural shift. By characterizing irresponsible behavior as just simply part of our culture, people may be able to avoid the social and legal consequences of their drunk actions. So as you can probably tell by now, the health of the state covers a lot of different ground. But the main lesson from all of it is that policies that limit our individual freedom should not be accepted lightly. They need to be assessed on two fronts, whether the limit to freedom is desirable and whether there is convincing evidence that the policy will be limited. So I'll now, now pass on to your old country. Given the breadth of the ground covered in the report, there are various windows through which one can enter this debate. I'll pick a few themes, make a few points, and then during the discussion we, get, we can get into further detail as required. I start with an answer to Oliver's question in his foreword, what kind of society do we want to live in? My answer is in a society that aspires to maximize the opportunities, capabilities, and incentives of each individual to pursue the kind of life he or she has reason to value, so long as in doing so, he or she does not inflict on other people's rights to do so. This, in turn, covers the role I assign to public policy. While it is not the state's business to tell people how they should be living their life, the state is an institution that has been deliberately created to organize collective action where required and justified to serve the societal end I have just referred to, in that context, it also has an extremely important long-term stewardship role to play. Like all other institutions, including markets, the family, the corporation, schools, hospitals, and churches, when the state performs its roles well, it can add a lot of value. When it is dysfunctional or performs poorly, it can cause a lot of harm. The challenge for all institutions, including the state, is to keep improving their governance structures so that they serve the fundamental purposes for which they are created. The state and markets and all these other institutions are complementary. I find it totally unproductive to cast all this in a market failure versus government failure context. That debate is logically and empirically unresolvable. It takes us nowhere. I have no issues with the discussion of externalities in the report, what they mean and do not mean. I totally agree with that. I agree with the point and warning about the dangers of the slippery slope presented by lifestyle regulations. However, I would not dismiss a role for the state in helping people through education, information, and appropriate nudging to reduce the chances of people hurting themselves, even if they do not hurt others. But I do accept the warnings in the report about being extremely cautious about how far we go in this direction and how we implement it. I agree that every intervention through the instruments of the state needs to be justified by a careful benefit-cost analysis. I note, however, that every benefit-cost analysis technically has to start with the specification of some sort of objective function that we are trying to enhance subject to a set of constraints. The objective function I would use is intergenerational well-being, with well-being broadly specified to reflect all the domains that people value. OECD work shows that these domains are pretty well defined and robust across time, cultures, and countries, and they go well beyond economic domains. I do not support the framing of benefit-cost analysis on a narrow formulation of utility optimization subject to a set of narrowly defined fiscal budget constraints. I strongly support evidence-informed policy making and agree with all the warnings in the report regarding arguments based on sloppy evidence around the effectiveness of syntaxes. That in that part, certainly, the report is brilliant. There is a lot of self-serving, very sloppy analysis which doesn't support the introduction of the kind of taxes we are talking about. I think we all agree that obesity, smoking, and alcohol abuse, the three case studies used in the report, are potential sources of social problems reflecting possibly significant negative externalities the term properly defined, and therefore serious candidates for policy interventions. 
in searching for policy solutions to social problems, we need to be open-minded and draw on all the wisdom emanating from all kinds of different perspectives. We are in search of complementary sets of policy instruments, not a single instrument that will internalize the consequences of the externalities caused with a view to changing behaviors on a sustainable basis. Key questions are, are interventions well targeted? Do they have the intended consequences in terms of changing behaviors? Do they have any unintended consequences, for example, regressivity? Do they pass the benefit cost test, as I've uh, formulated it? Building on one of the case studies in the report by way of example and to focus the discussion, we all agree that excess, excess consumption of sugary products, especially sugar sweetened beverages, SSPSs, is a major contributor to New Zealand's high rate of obesity, causing a range of related and wider health problems. Taxing unhealthy products and incentivizing their substitution with wealthier, healthier alternatives has been used by several countries in an attempt to reduce obesity rates. The intervention logic flows as follows. You tax or levy, this increases the price of the unhealthy items, this decreases consumption, this decreases calorific and sucrose intake, this decreases physiological <coughs> risk factors, this decreases the number of deaths. In the first stage of this logical map, own price elasticities are important. In the second step, cost price elasticities and substitution effects are important, and so on. There are potential slippages all the way. Even if the price increase would reduce consumption, it doesn't flow through and have the ultimate consequence we are talking about, which is about changing behaviors on a sustainable basis. Broadly speaking, empirical analysis seems to suggest that there will be a decrease in consumption in response to a reasonably significant price increase. However, work with the New Zealand expenditure data tends to confirm international evidence that such a tax would be regressive. Furthermore, low-income consumers have a lower elasticity of demand for SSPs, which may accentuate the regressivity of the tax and reduce the effectiveness of the tax in changing consumption behavior, which is ultimately what we're talking about. Another concern is the potential for consumers to substitute unhealthy but non-tax products for SSPs, leading to negligible health improvements. Weak targeting of high-risk population groups is yet another concern. So what do we do? Our current thinking suggests that a combination of a tax on SSPs, regulation on marketing to children, and a mandatory interpretive front of that labeling system may have some effect, but it still needs to be taken through a serious benefit cost screen. This is all work in progress, lots of work to do, and any effective and efficient intervention will almost certainly require a lot of cross agency collaboration. It is also important to draw on some of the recent work by the Behavioral Insights team in the UK, which suggests that how a tax is implemented, if we were inclined to do so, is also important to change behaviors. Their findings encourage us to think on consumer, producer, and retailer behavior in an integrated way. Product reformulation by producers is as important as changes of behaviors by consumers. Producers are likely to respond by reformulating their existing products if the introduction of policy changes such as taxes are well signaled. Implementation in the UK to not will not be starting until 2018. The tiered nature of the taxes is also important, which is another feature in the UK. The levy or tax will have a greater impact on behavior if the total additional cost of the sugary drink is passed on to consumers, particularly where there is an obvious substitute, such as in Court's zero version of the same brand. And it will also have a bigger impact if producers and retailers shift their marketing budgets to produce lower in sugar, where they will in future likely enjoy larger margins. Per se, how the producers and retailers react will have a knock-on effect on consumer behavior. We would obviously expect that the higher the differentiation in price, the greater the likelihood that individuals will substitute from a high to a lower sugar alternative. In a world in which reformulation by producers takes place, we would also expect sugar content of those drinks with high sugar content to drop. Uh, with the price response, there is evidence that the effect on consumption may be disproportionately larger above a certain threshold. In the UK, they use 12%. The effect of price changes will likely be stronger if retailers make these changes more salient at the point of purchase. Research has shown that consumers underreact to taxes that are not salient. 
In other words, if cans of cola are clearly marked as being higher in price because of the levy, this may lead to a greater effect on behavior. The signaling effects of the tax creates, namely that highly sugared drinks can be bad for your health and that there are alternatives available seem also to be important. Finally, whatever we decide to do, it is very important that any change in policy should be developed in a consultation with the wider industry after making a strong, strong case for the social good and defending it on the basis of uh, sustaining overall well-being. Thank you. Flash. 
and how the heck does Cotton On get to sell my daughter a little stick that puffs out air and smells like flowers and think that that's a good thing. So then we come, let's get back to my notes of which I actually have some. Um, <laughs> the Mind Party has looked on the lifestyle regulations favourably for making positive changes to what we consider negative social behaviours. During the 2014 general election, we campaigned on investigating the sugar tax on sweetened beverages and successfully lobbied the government to annually increase excise tax on tobacco products since 2010. Uh, too many of our people are dying from smoking-related causes. We lose 5,000 Kiwis a year through smoking-related causes, and uh, many of those are mum. Uh, we also were successful in getting the government to commit to a smoke-free Aotearoa 2025 goal, uh, which is actually to have uh, smoking in New Zealand under 5%. We we're almost there. We uh, tried to get, well, not almost there, <laughs> correct that, but uh, there are some places in this country where actually you're already about 5% of the weather might be one of them. Boom, again, David Seymour, two for two. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we thought, what about voluntary smoke-free communities? I was in Perth um, two weekends ago, and you can't smoke anywhere, and nobody does. I went up town at two in the morning, don't ask me why. I was actually <laughs> sober driving for somebody who wanted to go and see what the knife, my life looked like in Perth. After a couple of hundred, I was, thank you very much. But, um, what I was doing is I looked around and thought the place was full of young people. It was like gridlock at two in the morning, which I thought was remarkable. Um, but nobody was smoking. There was no hanging around the outside bars. There was nobody up the little alleyways. And I just thought that was remarkable. Went to a cafe area by the seaside, similar to our waterfront, and there was no smoking areas anywhere. And so, in fact, I went to go and ask people where the people smoke around here. And they said, in the car park. And they just had an MOU together because they decided that this is not something we want in our area of shops and our cafes and the little beach area that people bring their children to. And so if you wanted to smoke, you can smoke. You just have to do it in the car park to see you later. Um, I just thought that was really interesting. At the airport, you could walk out the door of the airport, people were smoking outside on the footpaths. They had a little cubby hole um, that was walled where if you want to smoke, that's the only place in the entire airport precinct that you could go and have a cigarette. They had vending machines and chairs. I thought people stayed there for a while. They had three or four. Um, I just thought that that was, it was something that they had just started to grow into. They are beating us now. They are whipping our butt around um, becoming a smoke-free country. Um, and they have just decided that they want to do that. If we as a nation want to do that, that is bad as saying that we shouldn't do it because we're impeding on somebody else's liberties. What about secondhand smoke? What about children who grow up in a home where parents have smoked? Are they more likely to then smoke themselves? Is that their free choice? Or have they been influenced to smoking because of it? I mean, the, the whole argument that has been um, reported here about whether or not you have a uh, tax on just these things, is it sugar to fight obesity, or is it um, smoking, are we impeding on somebody's um, liberties? Uh, well, actually, that all comes back to whether or not people have the same starting point at the beginning, right? Because uh, if everybody had an equitable starting point, then that argument would hold sway. But they don't at all. I just came from Auckland today. I was at the drug and alcohol court pilot that is happening in Auckland. It is remarkable. So instead of uh, throwing somebody in jail for drug and alcohol related offences, um, they keep them out and they put them into rehab and they spend actually about $6 million estimated savings on the number of people that they've put through the drug and alcohol court through rehab instead of throwing them back into jail because what does that do? How have um, their addictions impeded on the people around them? So. Again, I come back to the thing we should just, if we have no, uh, if we don't impede on people's civil liberties or their individual sovereignty, that's a nice term, um, then why not just let everybody smoke marijuana wherever they want? Isn't that the argument we have at the moment? What about P? Where do we stop? What about 
about heroin and cocaine, where we stop as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, surely that's fine. Except that these are addictive substances. And the woman who stood up in court graduating today because um, uh, four years ago she was um, drunk uh, behind a wheel and um, smacked into somebody and uh, they were injured, not killed. Um, and she was sent to this place instead of straight to jail. It was her third offence of drug, uh, uh, um, driving while intoxicated and something like her 14th offence of um, driving while disqualified. And so the judge took a punt and said, actually, we want you here. We're going to change your behaviour by sending you to um, rehab and then putting support around you and um, celebrating your successes as you go through these stages. And today she graduated. Um, she was uh, here and she was given a haka and um, uh, acknowledged by one of the local co-martyrs who were there. And she loved it. She said, that was just being Kiwi. That's awesome. That's part of who I am. Have we impeded on her liberties or somebody else's liberties? Or have we made a judgment because uh, her individual behaviour was now creeping onto everyone around her, including her children, uh, her sister's children and her family. And that's where we differ. So, if you are smoking at home, you are impacting on your children. If you're drinking at home, you are impacting on your children. If you are drinking to excess at home, impacting on your children and uh, you can't do things as individuals we don't see that you do things as, as individuals that's why we have far no order because when you do something to one person in the family it impacts on the entire family whether that's grandparents helping out because you've been um, not turning up to work because your drinking has become a problem whether that is your um, extended family who are coming to make an intervention for you or whether you're impacting on uh, your children's ability to um, to reach their full potential. I'm completely not stuck to any of those. But um, the thing is, I could go through all the reasons why, all the statistics why, but in fact, if we go back to sovereignty, individual sovereignty, well, how far back should we go? We could go back 175 years, and then we could really talk about what sovereignty means and whether or not we'd be really having this discussion um, in this forum if we had stamped our foot on sovereignty um, 175 years ago. So uh, sovereignty is something that is, in my mind, uh, something to be cherished, something to be upheld, something to be understood. And if we want to have equitable outcomes, where everybody can realise some sort of lifestyle where they get to have a holiday, that's a nice idea, isn't it? That people have holidays and free time, downtime, or a lifestyle. I don't know many people in my um, family, neighbourhood, uh, town, and a lot of towns around the country who actually enjoy a lifestyle. And talking to Marty, who now live in Perth, they all tell me, this is the first time in my entire life I've had a <coughs> lifestyle where I get to go and enjoy my weekends because I've been paid um, better than in New Zealand. And these were two top performing executives who couldn't afford a lifestyle in New Zealand. So lifestyle regulations, we absolutely think that they're necessary. And I'm going to go to one point that I actually did write down, <laughs> and it's this. Um, uh, Janessa's report um, sort of uh, talked about uh, John Stuart Mill sort of also had an interesting ring um, for considering the justification or other, otherwise of lifestyle regulations. Um, in a nutshell, Mill saw their individuals as independent and sovereign. The only just action that could be taken against an indi individual was that taken in the interest of self protection. This gives a basic justification for limited paternal actions. In the context of lifestyle regulations, Mill would conclude that some have come at a cost to our individual sovereignty and independence and are therefore wrong. For example, while it is justified regulating alcohol intake when operating a car, this framework would suggest using tax increases to curb the rate of smoking is considered overly paternalistic, according to Mill. But he also says 
um, that to bring a child into existence without a fair prospect of being able not only to provide food for its body, but instruction and training for its mind is a moral crime. If the parent does not fulfill this obligation, the state ought to see it fulfilled at the charge, as far as possible, of the parent. So, to paraphrase Mill, we cannot stand by and not act where the health and livelihood of our children is being compromised for the sake of ideology. Our inaction makes us just as accountable for their injury as if we were causing the injury ourselves. And if we look at New Zealand and think about whose children are most vulnerable, whose children are most susceptible to being at the bottom of all the disparities in this country, uh, then yes, we have no, um, we have no uh, qualm in suggesting that taxation uh, for the purposes that will aid the lifestyle of our children to reach their full potential, uh, we have no qualm in influencing and introducing that to the government and asking them to step in where their parents may not have <coughs> been for them, but actually intergenerationally, this has been an outcome of the way that we have um, impeded on sovereignty in this country.
or the value of the benefits. And if the value of the benefits exceeds the value of the costs, then it is a net good, and you are better off doing it than not doing it. And any government intervention that stops you from doing it is harming you. And if you don't believe that, you better come up with some kind of a theory about what harm is. You're going to have to come up with some kind of, I've met philosophical types who think they can come up with theories about what's good and bad that doesn't involve your preferences. And I find these people terrifying. <laughs> the minute you think that you can come up with a <coughs> good and bad, harm and benefit, that does not account for the preferences of the people involved, you are on your way to tyranny. I, I, I follow the view of um, Senator Graham. He's a great guy, uh, Phil Graham, the American. He was once being interviewed. Uh, he was actually interviewing somebody else, an educationist. And he said to her, he said, I know the reason I don't like your policy, she wanted an extension of state law and education. The reason I don't like your policy is I take the view that I care about my children and know more about them than you do. And she said, No, you don't. And he said, OK, then, what are their names? <laughs> so I think parents, I like, I prefer parents looking after children to the state. But anyway, let me, uh, let me continue. Now, there's a funny implication of the view that I've just given about what's good for you and bad for you. And apparently, one, which is that you can never do anything that's bad for you. Right? So if I do something, it must be that I value the upside more than I disvalue the downside. Therefore, it must be good for me. Therefore, whatever I do must be good for me. And that's crazy. We, we often do things that aren't good for us. And there's an obvious reason, and it's because you get things wrong. You overestimate the benefits or you underestimate the cost. And this happens all the time. I suspect that's why so many people still get married and have children. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, meddlers often use this obvious fact to justify their meddling. They say that this tax or prohibition or whatever it is is a kind of remedy for prevalent ignorance. If only people realized how bad smoking is, they wouldn't do it. They, they think it's worth the cost, but they don't understand the cost, and therefore they must be fiddled with so that they don't do it. Well, the problem with this argument is that they, the people who make it forget that ignorance goes both ways. Hands up, everybody here has been high on ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> and that many people are underestimating the benefit of excess. <laughs> and if only the government would subsidize them, so they could correct this error, this terrible ignorance. You see, this is the problem with this ignorance argument. It cuts both ways. Many, many people have no idea how much fun it is to smoke and get pissed and generally behave like an It's fantastic. <laughs> and it, it's so you. You can't run the ignorance line if you're going to be consistent without ending up subsidizing all this stuff that you probably don't want to. Now the other argument against my general position is that a lot of this behavior is compulsive. Right? So it's not, is it, I've got this model where people are making trade-offs, you know, there's the benefit and the cost, but it's not really like that, that the human behavior is much more compulsive. Now the first thing to notice, if that is true, that cannot possibly justify the tax. Because the tax will make no, have no effect. I'm just going to do it anyway. I don't respond to costs and benefits. I'm kind of automaton. So what will happen is if you tax the cigarettes, I've just got less money to spend on everything else. Because I'm, going to, I'm going to have the cigarettes no matter what. I'm not trading off costs and benefits. This is the point about price elasticity. So Janessa made. If people really are compulsive in their behavior, then the worst thing you can do is tax it. Because they'll keep on doing it. Then they'll have no money to spend on chicken. Yeah. And they'll be worse off altogether. I also want to add one thing. It's the idea that if a behavior is compulsive, then the cost-benefit analysis goes out the window. It's certainly not true. All sorts of behavior that's very good for you, and you can explain why it's good for you on a cost-benefit basis, is compulsive. My breathing. I've been breathing the whole time. I'm speaking. Quite compulsively. And I don't think anyone would argue that it was there for something that should be taxed. Your children. You know, your affection for your children presents most people who have children as not really a choice. And yet I wouldn't say that I would It's not necessarily damaging to you. Okay, so the idea that compulsion, compulsion is completely irrelevant to this analysis. Now, I want to end with uh, 
kinky homosexual sex. <laughs> in England, there was a famous case in the 1990s. A group of homosexual men used to get together in some of their houses and do nasty things to each other's genitals with knives. And they were arrested and charged with assault. And they lost the first case. They were convicted of assault. And then they went to appeal. And they made the argument to the judge, or the lawyer did, that it wasn't really assault because the men had volunteered to have their genitals cut. And the lawyer argued, apparently sensibly, that if volunteering for it wasn't sufficient to stop it being assault, then surgery is assault, rugby is assault, boxing is assault. And the judge, a chap called Lane, found against them. He said, no, no, it is assault. The, the consent argument only works in cases where the activity being consented to has a worthwhile purpose, <laughs> such as rugby <laughs> and, and surgery, but not kinky gay sex. Kinky gay sex is not a worth, worthwhile purpose. This is an actual case. And I think this gets to the heart of syntax and what's really going on. People behold someone going skiing. And they say, well, it's a bit risky, isn't it? But skiing's rather wonderful. And those costs are worth bearing for the glory of skiing. A decent chap, ski down the hill, and down the hill has nothing. <laughs> Getting high on drugs or smoking, yeah, it's a bit tawdry. Don't really like it, but like kinky sex. Not worth the risks, so let's ban it or tax it. It's just a kind of puritanical snobbery. And one thing you find, perversely, is that they always, these goody goods, they always attack the pleasures of ordinary people. Right? The kind of bodily, carnal almost, if you like, you know, sensational pleasures. They attack them, and then, as the crowning glory, they go and claim that they are the champions of these people whose pleasures they're attacking. It makes me feel like uh, drinking.